Hey, this is Pastor Allen. I'm the lead pastor here at First Baptist Church of Naples, and we are so happy that you have chosen to join us as we go through God's Word together. God's doing some amazing things here, and we pray that God's Word will transform you from the inside out. Our mission here is to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus Christ of all peoples. And our hope is, is that you are being a disciple that makes disciples. Now, if you don't have a church home, we would love for you to join us either in person or continuing online as we go into God's Word together every week. But if you are uh, a member of another church, we don't want this to be in any way, shape, form, or fashion a substitute uh, for you being connected to your local body. So our prayer is, is that God uses His Word to change you and to change others. So we pray that God will use you and this message for His glory. Have a great day. Well, take your copy of God's Word and turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to begin in a moment in verse 11. Ephesians 2, in verse 11, let's stand as we read the words of our God. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Since I didn't preach last week, this will be a five-hour sermon. <laughs> the Holy Spirit says today through Paul. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create into himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we have both access and one spirit to the father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You may be seated. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. Lord, as we look into this topic of what it means to be a multi-ethnic church, With the words of my mouth and with the meditations of all of our hearts, please you, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. What makes people feel uncomfortable in going to church? Have you ever been to a church and you felt uncomfortable? Uh, Maybe you're here this morning and that's you. (laughs) You know, when the the church itself uh, has a message, the gospel message, that at the very you listen to it, it's it's actually very offensive. The gospel is very offensive because the gospel tells people that they're sinners, that they are evil. Do you understand that that's the Christian message is that you are an evil person that cannot save yourself, that Jesus had to literally physically die on a cross? I mean, we have sang what songs all morning about Jesus's death on the cross And so the gospel message is that you are evil. Jesus died for you. And the only way that you have any chance of being saved, the only way that you can be saved is by surrendering your life to Jesus. To our world, that sounds like foolishness. But to those who are being saved, it's the power of God. See, that gospel message is all that we have here. That's all we've got. I've got nothing else. That's all we have is this gospel message. And yet this gospel message in our world compels people, but also repels people. But here's what I found, that the church has had the message, the right message for 2,000 years. And sometimes you can have the right message, but your actions and your attitudes can still turn people off. I've learned that you can win the argument and lose the audience. Gandhi, it is attributed to have said this, that I like your Christ, Gandhi said, but I do not like your Christians. 
because your Christians are so unlike your Christ. You know, every church is communicating something. Every church in America, every church in the world is communicating something. Our church communicates our something in our world. And, and what is it that we're communicating? Are we communicating conservatism? Are we communicating progressivism? Or are we communicating Christianity? Ray Ortland writes on this and he says, without a gospel culture, our churches risk standing as living denials of the very truth that they preach. And we wonder why people don't respond, why the ministry doesn't get more traction. When the gospel message works its way into the heart of the congregation, it will begin working itself out of the congregation. This is because the gospel does not stay put. The gospel is on the move. And that is all our church is built on. Our church's one foundation is Jesus Christ the Lord. And we have one faith, one truth, one baptism, one gospel. And that is what we built this church on. It's not built on a personality. It's not built on a program. It's not built on a place. It's not built on any kind of pre people. It is built on a person and his name is Jesus. And that's all we've got. And so the question is, are we like Christ to the world? And that's why our vision is that First Naples, First Baptist Church of Naples glorifies God by being a multi-generational, multi-ethnic, multiplying church that raises up the next generation of disciple makers, church planners, missionaries, and world changers that reaches Naples to the nations. Last week, Andy did such a tremendous job talking about that multi-generational aspect of that that the gospel compels us to be multi-generational, that we are called by God to be a multi-generational church, that all generations working together to reach the next generation for Jesus. And yet today we talk about being a multi-ethnic church. But I want you to hear this morning that being multi-ethnic is not some progressive agenda. Being multi-ethnic is not being part of a moment. Being multi-ethnic is being missiological and going after the very heart of God who made all people in his image for his glory. To not reach all people made in the image of God for God's glory would be to fail to miss the very heart of God. And so that is a part of our vision. Anytime there's a call of God, there are three types of people. Those who are ready to obey, those who are reluctant to obey, and those who resist. My prayer is that today that God would move us all to be ready to follow his will for our church, that we would go and be a multi-generational, multi-ethnic church. Well, that's the very heart of Paul. Paul here is mid-book as he is writing to believers in the city of Ephesus. Paul spent two years of his life planning a church in Ephesus. And the city of Ephesus, which is nestled on the Aegean Sea in modern-day Turkey in what was known then as Asia Minor, it was, it was sitting there on the west side of Turkey. It had spectacular sunset views. Uh, it was a large city, an affluent metropolitan city, and one of the most affluent in the ancient world. And this city and this church was not only affluent, but it was ethnically diverse. It was the Naples of Turkey. And with diversity and with affluence came division, came racism, came hatred. Scholars say that around the time that Paul was writing these words to the Ephesians, that Jews and Gentiles were murdering each other in the streets of Caesarea, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, all reported about the murders that were taking place in Caesarea. Paul here, as he's writing this letter, is writing in real time to real people going through real circumstances, does not in this letter sweep around the subject, but addresses the multi-ethnic implications of the gospel. What you understand is that the gospel of Jesus Christ changes you from the inside out. The gospel of Jesus is paradigm shifting. It was for the apostle Paul. Paul will tell the church of Philippi that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Hebrew national. He was one that felt it and loved it and that was his culture. But yet when Jesus came into his life, it changed him to have a heart for those he once hated, the Gentiles. 
because the gospel is always on the move and it changes us. So here's what we're gonna learn in the message this morning. The gospel teaches us that the walls of hostility have been destroyed by the work of Christ, paving the way forward for the church in the world. The walls of hostility have been destroyed by the work of Christ, paving the way forward for the church in the world. So let's just walk through that sentence. Number one, the walls of hostility have been destroyed by the work of Christ. In verses 11 and 12, Paul says, therefore. That therefore points back to what he says in verses one through 10 of chapter two. He says, therefore, remember, Paul is reminding them of their past in light of the gospel truths he has just shared. In light of the past of what God has done in your life and who you once were, that you had an identity before Christ interacted into your life. That at one time, in the eyes of God, you were alienated. You were strangers. You were hopeless. You were without God and you were far off. Paul reminds these believers that they were outsiders without any hope. Well, that's the condition of all humanity. But I want you to think a little bit more. When Paul was writing this letter to the Ephesians, telling them who they once were, our ancestors, unless you are Jewish, Greek, or Italian, our ancestors were the furthest people from God you can imagine. When the Bible talks about the gospel going to the uttermost parts of the earth, he's talking about us. Our ancestors were known by the civilized world as being barbarians. Our people were outsiders who painted their faces, worshiped trees, and howled at the moon. (laughs) And so Paul was saying to these Ephesians, you were alienated, but we are the uttermost. So theologically, all humanity outside of Christ is alienated, hopeless, without God and far off. But not only were these people that he's writing to theologically in that condition, but And when it came to the divide between Jews and Gentiles, ethnically, they were called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. Now, we read that, and we don't see anything of it, but this was a derogatory term. That's why in in the ESV, it's italicized with the uncircumcision. It it was pointing to the, the deep, complex, historical division between Jew and Gentile. And here's what you have to understand. To the Jew, the Jew was the insider. To the, to, to the Jew, the Gentile, uh, or pardon me, to the Jews were insiders. The Gentiles were the outsiders. One of the prayers that a Jewish man would pray every day is he would thank God. He said, God, I thank you that I'm not a Gentile, I'm not a woman, and I'm not a slave. That's what he would pray that every day. And it fed into the narrative that has really been since the beginning of humanity, that narrative of us versus them. Well, why do we have, even to our day, this day, an us versus them narrative? Here's why. So glad you asked. Alienation from God leads to separation with others. If the condition of all humanity is that we are alienated from God, then therefore the natural result is that we would be separated from others. That starts with Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve sit in the garden, when sin entered into the first family, what's the first thing that Adam does? Adam blames Eve. God says, why did you do that? uh, Adam says, it's that woman you gave me. And that transferred all the way to their children. You remember Cain? You remember Abel? Cain kills his brother Abel. Now the question is this, how long did Cain hate his brother? The answer, as long as he was able. (laughs) This separation, this hostility of Cain versus Abel, us versus them, has migrated to all humanity. So now we have a world filled with racism and sexism and elitism and ethnocentrism and all the other isms in the world. And those are sins that create division and hatred and strife and violence. That's why Dr. Robert Smith said, we do not ultimately have a skin problem in America. We have a sin problem. Spiritual issues, alienation from God, leads to social issues, separation from others. And until we see that all of these isms are spiritual issues, not merely social issues, we will never find the true and lasting solution to any of these problems. These issues are not head issues. They're heart issues. 
They're not political issues. They're spiritual issues. And the only solution to our spiritual problem is a spiritual solution. That is why critical race theory, political movements, philosophical ideologies, and government intervention will never solve the problems of our day. Only Jesus can. Only Jesus can. So it's this alienation with others that leads us, or alienation with God that leads us to separation with others. That's the dilemma of humanity. The world that we live in is alienated from God and therefore because of that, they are separated from each other. But then Paul says, that's who you once were. But verse 13, he says, but now. Thank God for the buts in the Bible. But now, the old identity narrative of who you used to be is who you used to be, but that's not who you are now. But now, just as he said in verse four of chapter two, but God, only God can change us from the inside out. Only God can solve our deepest problems. God has brought us near. Jesus has brought us near through his blood on the cross. Jesus came to this world to bring us back to God, to be our peace, to reunite us, to make us one, to tear down what divided us and create us into one new human. Jesus' death, that's why we sang about it this morning. Jesus' death killed the hostility between God and man. Jesus didn't just come to bring peace with God. Jesus is our peace with God. He didn't come to make peace with God possible. He came to make peace with God permanent. Jesus paid the debt. It caused the wall that separated us from God. For while we were still enemies, Romans 5.10 says, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Just, however, as Jesus broke down the wall that separated us and God, Paul wants us to understand that just as God broke down that wall, he also broke down the wall of hostility between us and other people. When Paul uses that phrase, wall of hostility, in verse 14, he thinks not only literal, but also metaphorical. And in Paul's mind, there was a literal wall. In the Mosaic law, Jews and Gentiles were divided through food laws, dietary laws, Sabbath restrictions, and ceremonial rituals. Even in the temple in Jerusalem, there was a wall. They kept Gentiles out. Josephus Flavius writes in his writings that there was a sign that said literally no Gentiles allowed. At the temple, there were Jews that could worship on the inside and Gentiles had to stay on the outside. And and those walls of separation in Paul's mind were not just metaphorical, but they were literal walls. These walls that were set up by the Jews in the temple And the walls that are set up in society are those walls that separate the good from the bad, the clean from the unclean, the functional from the dysfunctional. You know, all all cultures create walls. Every culture has a way of defining itself with walls. Those inside the walls are good. Those outside the walls are bad. You can travel to different parts of the world and you will see that all humanity has a way of separating people into categories, insiders versus outsiders, good people versus bad people, functional people versus dysfunctional people. And the question is, why do we do that? Why are we adamant about these distinctions? Here's why. I'm glad you asked. Smart group this morning. Because the natural default mode of humanity is self-justification. In other words, we want to be our own saviors. Sin gives us an innate desire to lift ourselves up above other people. It's a desire to self-justify and to prove that we are better than everyone else. And the reason why we have this desire to prove that we are not bums, to prove that we are better than other people is because of the inward insecurity we feel before God. See, in our hearts, every human knows they're not right with God. They may suppress that truth and unrighteousness, but there's that inner insecurity But yet if we can think and feel that we're better than others, if we can put 
ourselves and lift ourselves above others, we feel like we can have some worth and some value. And, and that's why this is an epidemic in all humanity. It's identity idolatry. It is finding our identity, our value, our significance, our worth, our pride in something other than God. And so what we do as humans, because we're insecure, because there's that separation between us and God, we look to things. We look to things in ourselves or in our group or in our tribe that set us apart. And so we take pride in our race and our nationality and our families and our sports teams and our skin pigmentation, our politics, our sexuality, our history, our gender, our education. We, we look to our careers, our, our money in the banks, our generation, and we look to those things so that we use those things to lift ourselves up above other people. And here's what I found, that when you and I idolize and idealize those things that we find is our identity, that is our nation or our politics or our race or our class or our generation or our gender, when we idealize those things and idolize them, then we demonize anyone who's not like us. We idolize this, this, this is what makes us distinct, this is what makes us better than everyone else. And we demonize those who are not with us. The past 48 hours have been very hard in the Brumback home. For those of you who have been watching these episodes here at First Naples, you understand that I'm a diehard Kentucky fan. It's been awful hard to be a Kentucky fan these past two days. But when my team is up, I'm up. And when they're down, I'm down. Anyone who threatens our supremacy, I hate. <laughs> I know hate is a strong word. We're all today cheering for Michigan State to beat those who worship a blue devil. <laughs> but we all do these. We, we look to things that puff us up. We look to all these different things. I'm being funny here, and, but the reality is, is that if we're really honest, we look to how much money we have or the car that we drive or the clothes that we wear or our generation or our skin color or our education or a myriad of different things to make us feel like we're something. But yet, let's be honest. Those things are cheap. They're quick. They don't last. Inwardly, we know we're not right. Paul says, listen, that wall of hostility between you and God where you're trying to constantly prove yourself before God, that's been broken. You don't have to do it anymore. You don't have to run around and try to prove like you're not a bum anymore. That's been done. And here's the other thing. Because of that, Jesus now gives us a whole new way of understanding those that are inside and those that are outside. The work of Jesus shows us that humanity has one problem, that's sin, and there's nothing that any of us can do about that problem. But the gospel also tells us that the one and only solution to that problem is the substitutionary death of Jesus who did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And here's what we have to come to grips with, that you and I are helpless on our own. None of us were born on the inside. None of us. We were all born on the outside. See, in humanity, there are no good people and bad people. There are no functional people and dysfunctional people. There are no winners and losers. According to God's word, we are all born bad, dysfunctional losers who desperately need someone to save us from ourselves. And the only one who can do that is Jesus. And so Jesus, in his death and resurrection, verse 15, verse, uh, the end of verse 15 says, he created one man out of two. He created those that were on the outside and brought them together. And so here's what you have to understand. If you are in Christ, your primary identity is not that you are an American or that you're white or black or brown or a Floridian or even a Kentuckian. Your primary identity 
is not found in those things, but you are a new race of humanity in Jesus Christ. All of those other things are secondary distinctions. Now, it's not that those distinctions do not matter. It's that they don't ultimately matter. Our cultural differences may distinguish us, but they do not define us anymore. And that is why we, as you read the Bible, as you read the the passage here, and we don't have the time to go into all the depths of this passage, but what you understand from reading scripture is that there are only two types of people in this world. Those that are inside Christ and those that are outside Christ. Those that are saints and those that ain't. Those inside of Christ are partners. See, our church is not in any competition with any other church in Naples. If there are gospel preaching churches filled with born again, spirit filled believers, they are not competition. They are our partners in the gospel. Those who are in Christ are partners and those who are outside of Christ are prospects. Our partners help us work together to reach those prospects to come into the kingdom of God. And here's the thing about the gospel. The gospel is the most inclusive, exclusive message in the history of humanity. Christianity, therefore, has been multi-ethnic, multicultural, multiracial, multi-socioeconomic. It has been that movement since its inception. Not because it's woke, but because Jesus broke the wall that separated us. That's it. Jesus has broken down the wall of hostility. It's gone. The wall of hostility between us and God and the wall of hostility that divided us. Do you see that? The wall between us and God and the wall between us and each other, it's been destroyed in the cross of Jesus Christ. But not only do we see the wall of hostility being destroyed, I told you this would be a five-hour sermon. That's why I drink a five-hour energy drink. But secondly, the way forward for the church in the world. What's the way forward? So stay with me. Stay with me. Don't fall asleep. Here's the big picture. Just as alienation from God leads to separation with others, so reconciliation with God leads to reconciliation with others. That, that's, that's true in every facet of your life. Let's even beyond race. This is family, this is life, this is relationships. So the gospel is fundamentally about God's reconciliation with us, vertical. And the fruit of that reconciliation is horizontal. It's reconciliation with other people. So to the degree, remember the first commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Second, love your neighbor as yourself. To the degree that you do the first is the degree that you'll do the other. And so what Paul grounds all of this in is that based on what Christ has done, as he has now reconciled all things into himself, that because of Jesus, verses 19 through 22, because of Jesus, all believers, every Christian around the world has three things in common. We have a common savior, the cornerstone, Jesus. We have a common truth built on the apostles and the prophets, the word of God. And we have a common purpose. We are spirit empowered to declare the gospel to the nations and make disciples of Jesus of all people. The church of Jesus Christ makes the gospel visible in the world. People from every ethnic background are fellow citizens of the same kingdom, members of the same family, built on the same foundation with Jesus as the cornerstone and filled with the same Holy Spirit. And that's why Paul tells the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 3, verses 9 through 10, that this is the mystery of Christ that was hidden for all ages that is now revealed in the church. The church of Jesus Christ makes the gospel visible to the world. That's why Dr. Tony Evans says this. The church is the place where racial, gender, and class class distinctions are no longer to be divisive because of our unity in Christ. This does not negate the differences that remain intact, but oneness means that the differences are embraced. So the unity that was destroyed by sin is restored in Jesus and is proclaimed by the church. 
And so a multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-socioeconomic church in which, people, in, which, in which peoples who have been historically divided are brought back together in Christ points to the mystery and the power of the gospel. And in a divided world, there is a beauty in a united church. And that's why Satan would rather divide a church than sell a barrel of whiskey any day. The unity, the justice, the equality that this world is longing for is only found in Jesus and only the gospel of Jesus can bring it about. And God has chosen this church and all churches to display the power of the gospel in the world. But I want you to hear something. That our goal is not merely being multi-ethnic so that we can be cool. Our goal is to be multi, is not to just be multi-ethnic, but to be an authentic gospel community made up of diverse believers in Christ from our community. We're not trying to be cool. We're not trying to be hip. We're trying to be biblical. If we were in Northern Ireland, it's very hard to be multi-ethnic, but you do the best you can. We want to reflect the diversity of our community. Churches that reach their community look like their community. Our community is multi-ethnic. Collier County is 27.2% Hispanic and growing. We have a growing African-American, Caribbean, and Asian-American community. And here's something else. Not just through migration is this stuff happening. But even through biological changes in our society, Generation Z, which Andy talked about last week, Generation Z, that next up and coming group, my children are in Generation Z, God help us, <laughs> is not homogeneous. Generation Z is the most racially diverse generation in the history of humanity. 51% of Generation Z are multi ethnic or non white. If you go to Collier County's public school's website, they will tell you that the students in Collier County, 55% of the students in Collier County schools live in non-English speaking homes or primarily non-English speaking homes. Collectively, these families in Collier County speak 104 different heritage languages from 76 different countries of origin. It's changing you either resist it or you embrace it. The embrace is not to compromise the truth. The embrace is to love people, to point them to Jesus. That's it. What does a multi-ethnic church look like? You know, there's a lot of analogies I could give you. The best analogy I can give you is this, beef stew. <laughs> Have you ever had a good beef stew? I mean, you think about it right now. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. You have a beef stew with cornbread. Oh, for the glory of God. <laughs> Matter of fact, let's just chit in church right now. In, in a beef stew, you have different ingredients. You have beef and you have stew. <laughs> in that, you have carrots, onions, broth, bay leaf, different things. Individually, you can eat them. Like you can eat a piece of beef and you can eat a carrot and you can gnaw on an onion. Just we won't be around you. you bay leaf, I wouldn't recommend chewing on that thing. You can drink broth, but you put them together and you let them marinate and you let them cook and you let them stew together, and out comes something beautiful. And here's what happens. Each component in that beef stew still remains its component. So you have beef, you can tell the difference between beef and a carrot. You can tell, now some of you that are vegans, I mean, some of you, tofu stew. Well, I mean, that sounds great, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> God help us. But, but you, you, what you see is that each of these ingredients remain distinct, but yet when put together, 
they season each other. They take upon the characteristics of each other and, and they become something that's a whole lot better together than they are separately. That's a multi-ethnic church. It's not that if you're white or black or brown that you lose your distinctiveness in that. It's not that if you're from the north or the south or the east or the west or from a different country that you just stop being who you were. No, you are who you are authentically that God had created you in Christ to be. But yet we learn from you, you learn from us. And it's not, not that we become nothing, it's that together we're so much better. That's a multi-ethnic church. Jerome Gay said that we are not to be color blind, but color engaging. I don't need to be blind to those around me that are different. I don't need to act like I don't sometimes make assumptions about them. The key is to not be led by those assumptions and prejudices and allow God to use a diverse community to shape me more into the image of Christ. God created all ethnicities. He created all peoples and all of them are a tapestry of his glory and his grace. And I want to be a reflection of that. Well, how can we make this happen? Two ways, real quick. One, through humility. Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant to your, than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. To be multi-ethnic requires sacrifice, that you have to crucify your preferences, your styles, your wants for others. But it's not only through humility, but it's through intentionality. As a church, nothing happens through osmosis. Nothing happens by accident. We must make intentional steps to ensure that people from every background feel welcome through our leadership, our platform, our friendliness, our musical styles, what we celebrate and our love for each other. We don't compromise truth here. We'll never compromise truth here. We won't ever condone sin, but we will love others. And to do that, we have to get intentionally engage people not like us. We tend to only hang out with people that look like us and think like us and talk like us. But for us to actually learn and to be the kind of people that God wants us to be, we have to be out in the world. We have to be around people that's not, that are not like us. Albert Tate, in his book, Letters to a Birmingham Jail, said the question isn't guess who's coming to church, but rather guess who's coming to, di to dinner. We have to think beyond just gathering on Sundays to life on life engagement. It's not just what happens in church on Sundays, but what happens in our dinner table during the week. If we really want to be the change we want to see in the world, it starts with you and me. And the question I wanna challenge you is this, do you have friends in your life that are not like you? Are you seeking to embrace and learn from other cultures? Do you have relationships that would make the watching world wonder how in the world are they friends? And the only common denominator is Jesus. Think about this. We have people from all over the United States and all over the world in this service right now. Literally, dozens of countries different backgrounds. We have Southerners. We have Yankees. We have people even from California. <laughs> All of them here together. We have that ability to proclaim to the world that the differences that are between us are not distinctive. They're not greater than the unity we have in Jesus Christ. The church best proclaims the power of the gospel through transformed lives. Transformation is the revelation that the information has taken root. And transformed lives by the gospel are the best witness to a watching world. The world expects us to fight each other. The world expects us to look down at each other. The world expects us to be bigoted and mean-spirited. But when we show them by our actions and our attitudes that we're not that, they've got nothing to say got nothing to say. Let me end with this. I know we're all excited. There's only one race, the human race, one problem, sin, and only one solution, the blood of Jesus. And as the old saying goes, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. The gospel takes those who are natural enemies and brings them together. You and I have been brought together through Jesus, and that is why we celebrate as we longingly anticipate the day before the throne where every tribe, every tongue, every language, and every nation will be represented in heaven before the throne of God. 
And therefore, we want the unity of our community to reflect the diversity of eternity. Let me end with this. A couple of years ago, I was in northern Iraq on a mission trip working with our people that are there. And I went into the house of a man. You can show the picture. He was an Iraqi Arab, uh, was from southern Iraq, but moved to Turkey because of the war with ISIS. After things settled down, America came and got rid of ISIS. He moved back to northern Iraq, which is known by those people as Kurdistan. He grew up a Sunni, Muslim, devout, but during the war began to become disenchanted with Islam. And so uh, by the, the people that we have there and through our partners there, I was able to be in this man's house. And the reason that I was in this man's house is because the guy in the red shirt bought a car from this guy and established a relationship over these months. And so we came for the sole purpose of coming to the man in the blue shirt to share Jesus with him. He, as we got into his house, we sat on the floor, he would give us chai tea, which is customary. And so we have those little glasses of chai tea and we took those glasses of chai tea and shared the gospel with him using three circles. We told him that God, there's a God who created everything, that the, the, his design is perfect and, and yet this world is broken. It's broken because of sin, because sin is a desire to go our way rather than God's way. And in that brokenness, we try to fix our brokenness on our own through, through even through religion or through drugs or through different things to try to fix ourselves, but yet we cannot fix ourselves. But yet the gospel of Jesus is that Jesus came while we were in a mess to fix us and get us out of the mess. And if you repent of your sins, turn from your sin and turn to Jesus, you can then recover and pursue the design that God has for your life. And we shared that gospel with him. And we looked at him and said, Do you, are you ready to believe this? And the man looked at us and said, I believe in Jesus. And we were like, it can't be that quick. So we shared that again. <laughs> and we went over the gospel again using these three circles. And he said, I believe, I believe. And then we said, you show us this story then. And he showed us the gospel story. He said, I believe. And we said, why do you believe this? What would cause you to want to believe this? And we were expecting to hear he got a dream or a vision or something. And here's what he said. He said, it's the love of Jesus that I see in Christians. He says, when I fled Iraq and went to Turkey, I was in a Christian village, and those Christians were the nicest people I've ever met in my life. And they took care of me, and they fed me, and they housed me, and they clothed me, and they loved me, and they didn't want anything from me. And he says, when I moved back to this city in northern Iraq, I looked for a Christian neighborhood, and he says, I found one. And he said, in all of my life, I've never met people who are more caring and more loving than Christians. And he said, then I met you guys, and I told my wife, I want what they have. Now, in that little living room setting, the wife couldn't be in that room because the men were meeting. But she was standing there in the kitchen, and she heard every word that we were sharing and her heart language. We got a call that evening. The man in the red shirt got a call that evening from the man in the blue shirt. And he said, I shared that message of three circles with my wife. And she believes in Jesus too. And they have been baptized and they are part of the church that's there. And every time we go to different countries, every time we see other people give their life to Jesus and we're seeing them and I can't speak their language and they can't speak my language. And they don't look like me. And they don't think like me. And they may not vote like me. But every time I see them, I see them get saved. I see the joy of Jesus. And I look forward for that day when I'm in heaven. And I see that man. And I see his wife. And I see those kids all raising their hands in worship to King Jesus. That's what gets me excited. Because the differences we have down here will pair, pale in comparison to the unity that we'll have up there. And that is why Revelation 7 says, after this, I, John, looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every tribe, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples 
and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, say this with me, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Why do we have to wait for us to be with every tribe, tongue, and nation up there? Why can't we have a foretaste of it here at First Baptist Church of Naples? The wall of hostility has been destroyed and the way forward for our church is to be a multi-generational, multi-ethnic, multiplying church that raises up the next generation of disciple makers, church planners, missionaries, and world changers that reaches Naples to the nations. God bless you. Thank you for joining us as we go through God's word together. I pray again that God will transform you from the inside out. So as we say here at first, you have come to church, Go out and be the church. Have a great week of worship. We can't wait to see you soon.